You know, like, like you're a parade to rest, you gotta keep your left foot. <laughs> All right. And it's so, funny, I still catch myself yeah. doing that too. My name is Connie Barg. I'm from Dubois, Idaho. I'm here representing Clark County as their county central committee chairwoman. And we are at the Idaho Republican State Central Committee summer meeting here in Boise. And you're also a military veteran. Would you give us your military resume, please, Connie? I am. I joined the service in 1972 at the, toward the end of the Vietnam War and the reversion. I um, spent time in Key West and in Okinawa, I was in communications, and um, it was a great experience, but I don't think I'd want to do it again. <laughs> now, Connie is part of the resolutions committee that met last night that was the first to consider the resolutions before they go to the main bodies we saw today, and there was a resolution to bring the troops, troops home from Afghanistan, specifically to as a political matter of political sentiment to say this is what we'd want to see happen we support president trump's sentiment and his desire to bring the troops home from afghanistan and uh i was i was very honored that i was given the chance by by ryan the, the chair to speak last night as a guest uh obviously in favor of that resolution and, and last night you voted for it but then today when it went to the main body you voted against it now that's it's very suggestive of a very nuanced thinker and yet a very conflicted mind. And so I'm, I'm really curious, first, if, if, maybe start why you started in support of this resolution. Well, as a former military, um, I'm all in favor of supporting our troops in, in whatever they're doing. And we've been in that situation a little bit too long, actually. Um, but in the course of the conversation today, there were commanders who were deferred a little bit from deployment recently because of medical things who felt like this was more of a political than it was boots on the ground and their argument and I couldn't quote details but compelled me to say well all right maybe what you see on the surface of this resolution speaks deeper when you're in a command position and you have to make the tactical decisions that John Q. Public doesn't always see or doesn't always recognize are, are there to do that. And listening to their concerns kind of made me change my thinking just a little bit. And while I still support Trump and his decision and what we're trying to do and the fact that it probably is time to bring troops home, um, I felt like I couldn't in good conscience support this again on the floor. All right, so there were two very good speakers earlier th earlier today in the general meeting uh, who were both, uh, I believe, uh, guardsmen commanders, right, uh, who, had, who had deployed, uh, who spoke against the resolution. Um, and of course, there was the one veteran, Dan McKnight, who yeah. was the co-author who spoke in favor of it. But I, I, so, so I want to just shift gears just a little bit here because w w the way you answer that suggests a, a, a deeper issue here as a question because you said support the troops no matter what they're doing. Now I think you'd, you wouldn't be so naive as to suggest that government is never corrupt and that the troops will follow orders. You know, like, I mean, I can tell you from my experience, like, you know, and you know, you swore an oath to the Constitution. You didn't swear an oath to follow orders or to the president, right? We swear an oath, at least in, in theory. You have to like them. You just have to follow them. Well as long as the orders are lawful. And you're actually specifically told, at some point at least, although they don't emphasize this very much, right, that if you get an unlawful order, you're supposed to disobey, right? And now, for me, this is actually very personal because I was ordered to torture civilians in Iraq, uh, sleep deprivation um, in, in guarding detainees. And I wish I had disobeyed. I wish I had told the person who gave me that order, hey, uh, and not to make a big deal out of it, not to say, hey, screw you, I'm rebelling, you know, right. but to say, hey, I'm pretty sure this is not an appropriate order. My conscience and my analysis is kicking in going, you gave me this Geneva Conventions card, and I'm pretty sure this is in violation. Maybe you made a mistake, let's reconsider, and, and, and eventually say, no, I'm not going to do this, right? right? And, and take the consequences to not commit that evil that I know now in hindsight really truly was evil. So to extrapolate that to the big picture then you would say, well, the war, the orders to deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan are constitutionally illegal 
because there was no declaration of war. And so this opens up this, this bigger question. If you, if you can accept this, Connie, right, that leadership right. makes mistakes, and that, that we, as political activists now, as veterans, uh, uh, you and I, right. uh, as, as everybody in, in, in the room today, um, as, as the civilian oversight of the military, that, that there is a role always to question and to look at first principles. So how do you think that applies to the question of the resolution today? Mm. Tough one, right? Yeah. 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 yeah, it gives you something to go home and really chew on because you, you grow up with a certain set of values and things that are right and things that have kind of been ingrained all of your life and family tradition or things like that. And then the world has changed so much that it, it seems like it kind of clouds some of that. And this, this whole question is like, okay, well, how do I really feel? And you think you feel one way and then... I don't know, I get people that say, well, I've been there, I've done this, and this, and this, and this, and you're going, okay, well, maybe I don't have all the pieces of the puzzle to get a complete picture of what's going on. And that's where, like, the commander that talked just now is like, okay, well, I never thought about the things that he's bringing up. And so I think you need to, A, be open to what's being said and not have set in concrete preconceived ideas and then be willing to say okay but I need more information or I need um, more ideas or I need something that will tell me what's really going on. Now there's one thing I was a little disappointed today and the lack of being in the conversation was an actual debate on the war itself. So stepping back from the resolution and the arguments, because the commanders who spoke today weren't really saying, they weren't making pro-war arguments, right. they were making arguments, civilians stay out of military decisions. And I, I mean, I think that's, that in and of itself and they is- should. Well, they no, should. well, we have to have civilian oversight if we have a just military, well, right? But you can get people doing oversight who don't know what they're doing. Um, you can't, I can't even begin to go tell Hewlett Packard how to run their company when I don't understand all the dynamics. Right. Well, this is a matter of like ethical oversight, people who are killing well, in our name. Yeah. I mean, I, so, so maybe we're in disagreement here, but that's okay. Let me, let me step back and just ask them, what is your general thought on our current uh, military position in Afghanistan? Um, I kind of have felt for a long time that it's, we're in a kind of a no-win situation. And I don't have answers for that. I don't know how you, how you fight what it is that we're fighting there and ever win. I think their ideology is so ingrained that I don't think their mindset's going to change. And I don't know, sadly, we've lost many lives that maybe we didn't need to, but I don't know how, I don't know how you ever go in and win that. Okay, so uh, as a definitive answer, like World War II or World War I, or yeah. um, you know, Vietnam was one of those no-win situation kind of a thing too. And I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Okay, so I'm going to go to two big hard questions before I let you go and give you the final word. One, the founders of this country were against the concept of a standing army. They preferred a militia-based defense, knowing that that's the free market answer, whereas the military is socializing defense services. And, and I, one thing the Republican Party is pretty unified on is at least the ideal of the free market. And, and, and that being said, do you think that the military is, is an un-American institution as a socialist enterprise version of what the founders advocated in a militia-based defense? Yes and no, I would have to say, because I don't believe that when they set that up, I don't believe that they could have foreseen what we are today. And I don't know, maybe I don't have enough information to know whether the concept that they envisioned would actually work with the world as it is today. Um, I'm not opposed to our military. If I were younger. I would probably do it again, even though I have some reservations about <laughs> being on the front line when I was in. Obviously, we weren't in combat situations. Um, but 
I would do it again because many, 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 many people died to give me the freedoms that I have. And if I'm not willing to go do my little tiny bit of, of keeping it that way so that somebody else can, then I think that's very selfish. Okay. So last hard question. This is going to be the worst one by far. Uh, I, I'm hearing from you a lot of arguments from authority or appeals to authority in, in, the, in the way that you're making a case one way or another and that, that your vote was swayed today by information from these two uh, National Guard commanders who spoke against this resolution, excuse me, resolution would suggest that you're making decisions based on immediately available information rather than first principles. So if there's a first principle here about ethics, in terms of when it's okay to use military force or when it's okay to use violence against someone, I would ask you, and this is the biggest, hardest question, when is it okay to use violence against another person? Ooh. My take on that would be, from a purely personal point of view, when I am personally threatened or the... the I don't know, the belief system, if that's the right word, is threatened, then I would say yes, and certainly if someone were breaking into my house, then... In the action of violating right. me physically, right? Then, then I would say, you maybe better take a closer look at what you're biting off, because right. you might bite off more than you can chew. <laughs> okay, so no, this is great, because you're getting it, what for me as a libertarian is like the first principle here is you own yourself, and the only way that it's legitimate for me to use force against you is if it's in defense. And I can't say, well, you, you said threatening, right? And it's right. like Benjamin Franklin, you know, my right to swing my fist ends where your nose begins, right? Something like, Something that. like that. So if, if that's the case, then I, you know, what, what constitutes a threat might be a gray area, but I don't think it's appropriate for me to attack you if you're thinking about hitting me. But well, if you start <laughs> well if you start if you but if you start swinging the fist i can use defensive force and i think if you if you analyze the foreign policy issues that we're talking about from that perspective from first principles i would suggest to to connie and to anybody else who, who's who's looking at it from this perspective that getting to those first principles makes it a lot easier to understand the immediate policy decisions so i hope you consider that i hope anybody else who's watching this who's who's back and forth on this issue there are a lot of americans i mean that's why we're still there uh, this, and then and that's the problem too is that you know the, this this equivalent equivocacy or equivalence in in uh, as civilians looking at this trying to do, think being tempted to well we're going to defer to the military that's how they take advantage of us. that's how the military industrial complex that eisenhower warned us about has really over militarized so many things and i mean any honest republican who's for small government and free markets has to look at the military and go that's a boondoggle of a big government program. No matter how you cut it, no matter what your objectives are, if you care just about efficiency, it's insane. It's a huge waste of, of lives and money. But that being said, Connie, I did say I'd give you the last word. So is there anything you want to share with the audience uh, or with me about, about your military experience, about this issue, or anything we talked about? Keep the good fight going. For freedom. Yes. Thank you, Connie. Oh, that was great. Adam vs. the Man is made possible by people who care about freedom, like our Patreon supporters whose monthly contributions get them perks and exclusive content. Find out how you can help by going to patreon.com slash Adam vs. the Man. Adam vs. the Man is made possible with support from SmartCash. Check out smartcash.cc to find out more about this powerful, business-focused cryptocurrency that is fast, easy to use, and community-centric. Smart Cash is designed to be securely used for day-to-day -day transactions and put the currency back in cryptocurrency.